What's up? You're listening to The Long Game, and I'm your host, David Lee Kim, co-founder of Omniscient Digital. In this episode, we chat with Peter Caputa. Peter is the CEO at Databox, a tool that lets you connect and track data for multiple software solutions in one place. Instead of logging into multiple platforms and generating separate reports, you can build a centralized and customized reporting dashboard with the most important KPIs from each platform. Peter also serves as an advisory board member to companies like Pandadoc, Pantheon, and Grapevine Logic, and he was previously VP of Sales and HubSpot. In his conversation, we talk about his experience transitioning from engineering to sales, sort of to marketing, and into a CEO role. Peter shares his thought process behind joining Databox and how his previous experience with content and SEO ultimately influenced his go-to-market strategy for Databox. He also talks about the challenges of marketing teams reporting on various metrics from different tools and all the competitors who are also trying to solve for that same problem. This prompts the ultimate question, how is he differentiating? How is Databox building a moat around themselves to compete against their other software companies? That's when we really get into the core of the conversation. I think you're going to learn a lot. Here's my conversation with Peter Caputa. Thanks, David. It's good to be here. Looking I'm forward glad. to our conversation. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad the second time you tried, your dogs didn't decide to chime in again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, food, right. food quiets them down. Yeah. Well, I, I'm super excited to have you on the show today. Uh, we met back at HubSpot many, many years ago, and you're kind of a living legend there, the godfather of the HC program, I've heard you've been called. I don't know if People say yeah. that out loud to you or not, but they we're not going to spend too much time talking. <laughs> yeah, we uh, we won't spend too much time talking about HubSpot because I want I want to get to DataBox, but uh, cool. I wanted to ask maybe starting from maybe not the absolute beginning, but earlier on in your career, I I just learned in my research that you were an engineer to start, and you ended yeah, up once an engineer, which, always an engineer, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, but you ended yes. up in sales, which is. I yeah. don't see that very frequently, but how did you end up going from engineer sales, sort of a marketer? I, I call you a marketer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like to Tell consider us. myself a sales and marketing uh, marketer, yeah. as we would call it at HubSpot. Um, <laughs> yeah, I studied engineering. I was always I always really enjoyed math and science, and uh, and so I went to school for engineering um, because I figured it would be a well paying job, um, and then. Out of college, I did engineering for like six years and it was a relatively old industry and I just felt like everything moved really slow. Uh, right around that time is when the internet kind of like was born. Um, what kind of you know, engineering? Late 90s. Uh, chemical engineering is what I studied, but I did mechanical engineering out of, out of school. Okay. Uh, the work I did was more mechanical engineering. But um, And then... And so the internet got big and I decided, all right, well, I want to learn this. So I actually ended up applying for a job at the same company because they had decided to launch like an e-commerce storefront. This was like in 99, 2000. And, uh, and so oh. I took that job because I had product knowledge and they needed somebody with product knowledge uh, for our product knowledge, like the company's product. And, and so we did the project and like, well, what are you going to do now? And I said, I don't know. What do you want me to do? Like, well, why don't you go learn how to code? Then you can maintain the thing. So I went and took a course, like a nine month, 12 hour a week course and learn how to do web development. Um, all the relevant skills at this point because the technology has changed so much. But um, so I ended up doing that. I started a, a, a SaaS company on the side while I was at that company. Uh, ended up going full time with that and then realized that um, we needed to actually sell it. And so somebody needed to learn how to sell. So I ended up hiring a sales coach um, and learning, you know, learning how to sell in my startup, and th that ultimately, few, few, a few steps led to me joining the sales team at HubSpot. Got it. So it was really out of necessity because you're like, wait, why aren't we getting customers? We <laughs> and you decided, yeah, to yeah, like we were getting customers. I wasn't charging enough, um, and I wasn't very All good at it. Things. I didn't have any predictability <laughs> in it. Like it was, yeah. So it was like, so I needed. And at the time, I had met like a sales coach, the guy guy named Rick Robert, who you might follow, who was Mark Robert's dad. Is Mark Robert's dad? Mark was the first VP of sales at 
and and, and ultimately CRO at HubSpot. Uh, and so that's that's how I ended up connect getting connected to to HubSpot was through my sales coach. Yeah, and I think I've heard on previous interviews you've done, you're like employee 14 or 15 at HubSpot. You spent like nine years there and everyone knows at this point you built the agency partner program that ended mm -hmm. up making up like 50% of the annual revenue revenue for the company, which for anyone who knows HubSpot, that's a lot of revenue. Uh, yeah, close so, to a billion now, yes. Yeah, and we'll, we'll skip all that because if anyone wants to learn about that story, you have plenty of interviews about it, but yeah, yeah, I want to get to Databox, right? Like I think, my understanding of the story of Databox is uh, you were advising some companies, an investor in one of those companies came to you and said, hey, check out Databox. Um, is that how the opportunity came up? Like, how did, why did you decide to join Databox? Yeah, pretty much. I decided to leave HubSpot. Um, I, the, I, I got the channel to about a little less than, or a little, right around $100 million. I forget the exact number, but around $100 million in revenue, which was about half of the revenue, a little less than half of the revenue at that point. Um, and it was a machine at that point. There wasn't as much innovation. Um, it, the, the program was kind of being more integrated into the business. It was a little standalone for when I was operating it. And that, that's not my forte. I don't have the patience to like sit in meetings and take 12 months to make decisions. And, and some of the decisions I wasn't happy about, and I'm like, ah, I think I'm going to move on. Like no objection to what you're doing. You're doing the right things for the business. I think they've done right by the partners, um, but just not my not my passion. And so like uh, I ended up, guy. yeah, yeah, maybe zero to ten, zero to one hundred, <laughs> but not not zero to one billion. Um, so <laughs> yeah, that's fine, right? I, I can do just fine at the zero to one hundred million mark. Um, yeah. So so I ended up, you know, going to Brian and say, hey, I think I'm going to leave. And, he's, and I said, but I'm not in a rush, like. Um, I want to do right by you and the company and the partners. And so, so I ended up sticking around for another year, like mostly just writing on the blog, the sales blog. Yeah. So I was a very high paid, high paid blogger at the time. <laughs> um, and I started advising a few companies, but my intention was to go and start something. And I actually started meeting with VCs, angel investors, um, to like kick that off. And, um, and I met one investor, um, an accomplice, uh, TJ Mahoney. He's like, well, you got to meet Davrin. Like it's a re it's a little bit of a reboot, but it's like aligned with your interests and your market. And I'm like, well, I really don't want to like join another company. And he said, well, he's looking for a CEO. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. So I ended up meeting with him. I said the same thing to the founder who I've now worked with for six years. Like, I'm not interested in, in a job. I like, want to start my own thing. I'll meet with you and I'm happy to advise you or whatever. And so we, we took like six months to get to know each other. Um, you know, I tried the product, I introduced to a few people, I got some feedback and tried to f see if there was like a market need there. Um, and, and once I realized there was a market need there and I liked that, te the team, um, I said, all right, let's, let's try this out. So I ended up, um, joining Databox as CEO and, uh, six years ago. Yeah. What was it about the team or the product that made you believe, yep, there's a, there's a huge opportunity here that. That you decide, hey, I'm not going to do my own thing, and instead join. This. Yeah, um, I th I think the they build so a bunch of reasons they build a great product. Like UI UX is excellent, and that that was at the time there weren't a lot of teams that could pull that off. Um, we had, they had kind of through trial and error and a few failures, they had found a market that I yeah um, that I thought would work. It was the same market as I was had experience in. Um, which was really interesting. That was like when I was going to start my next thing, like that was number one is like, I want to continue to help marketing agencies and marketers. Um, and so that was, that was, box was checked. And then, um, you know, I evaluated like, all right, well, there's something I want to build. I could maybe build it with this team or I could go like start a new one. And it just felt like a shorter path. Actually, in reality, I think it was a longer path to building what I wanted to build. But, uh, but, uh, um, but that was my logic at the time. And the, the, the real reason that I was attracted to is like, it's about data. And I think over time, businesses are run less on instinct and more on data. And I think that will only increase, right? Like we're seeing just, I think you're seeing early innings still of, of AI being applied to business. And right, all we're doing now is like, you, you know, I know you guys use it to some degree and you write about it yourself, but I feel like we're, we're scratching the surface. Like we're using it to write outlines for articles or, 
you know, uh, reword our grammar, right? But in, in, in the future, not too distant future, I believe AI will say, here's what you should do today to maximize your productivity. Or, um, you know, here are the four decisions you should make. And this is, we suggest, this, this decision has an 80% probability of being the, the best one for you, right? Like, I think we'll get to that point where combination of company performance data, market research data, um, competitive data um, will 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 be e more easily processed by machines than humans, uh, and and that I saw that future sort of back then. Um, and the founder and I talked about a lot of that back then. Like we have early mockups of like here's a recommendation engine we're going to build on top of all your company data, um, and so we're just now building that stuff now. We've been building it for like two years. We're just now launching some of that stuff now, yeah. but that was. That was the vision I saw is just like data, data being more and more important and more and more of it, right? Like the amount of data that just marketers produce is ridiculous. Um, yeah, not wonder, to mention like I mean, the data we gather from, from our customers in an automated or yeah. semi-automated ways, right? I, I frankly haven't thought about the future that far ahead in terms of data and like AI for making business decisions, but you've got me thinking about a world mm -hmm. where let's say a company has their dashboard or like you're at a CEO, you see your dashboard and it says like, Hey, here are the options based on this, the data we're seeing. Other CEOs in the past have made these decisions, seen these results. Here's the likelihood that it will succeed for you. Like which direction yeah. do you want to go? Like, right. I mean, that's, exactly. that seems like kind of, uh, more sci-fi. I don't know if that's, <laughs> in, in, I don't think in, we're that far. Future, we're not that far yeah. away. Yeah. Like we, some, like we have a bunch of features in, in that are about to launch that are, it's like predicting the future of where your performance will be identifying, you know, blips in your, in today or yesterday's performance that you need to address. Like all these things that most companies maybe do monthly, but most of the time they're doing yeah. quarterly and annually. Right. Um, that the Sys software will, will alert us to. I'll tell you something that may, might even be more valuable is here's a blip, but it's not an issue because of seasonality, like stuff like that. Yeah. Like, I've worked yes. with many clients where they see this dip and it's happened for one day and they come to us kind of panicking. We kind of need to walk them, walk them back and say, Hey, this isn't an issue. It's just natural fluctuation. Don't worry about it. Like, yeah, I'm, yeah. Even uh, that sort of piece. If, of I had to, if, if I had a dollar for every time I had to answer the question on March first, why? Why did we? Why does our performance go low in February? Like that. That one, right? That one's like, duh. Of yeah. course, we had like literally four last working days. Um, but yeah, no. Actually, we're building. We've built a forecasting model. This is the this is the feature first feature that we're launching most likely next month, um, where the forecasting model looks at your uh, seasonality, but not just on a monthly basis, also on a weekly and a daily basis. Um, wow. and, and and then looks at the trends on those different horizons as well and says, and that, that goes into the forecast because, you know, like April, you wouldn't think April's performance would be lower, but if you look at the calendar, there were, there were only, uh, I can't remember if it was 20 or eight, like I think there were 20 working days, whereas most months we have 21 or 22 working days. And when you're working on a funnel where it's very heavily based on people searching for your solution on Google during the weekday, like that two days is a big, a big fluctuation. So, um, so that's the kind of thing that would be like, here, here's what you're expected to forecast. And that's not out of bounds, right? Um, that's well, normal. Yeah. I got to tell you that one thing is making me wonder if I should migrate <laughs> off Looker Studio to, <laughs> to Databox now, because it happens every, almost every summer. <laughs> like, hey, it's the summer. No one's searching for your product during the summer. Everyone's on vacation or after a right. federal holiday, like long weekends, like traffic dips yeah. or something. So yeah. if we could just yeah. preemptively address all that. We also, I also, Our, we also have um, benchmark trends that we've launched for free. At, we've talked about it at benchmarks.databox.com and they, and like I, I've started to see like trends and certain things that are happening, not necessarily seasonality, but like cause and effect. Like it seems based on our data that Google, um, the click through rate from a large sample of websites from Google has, has gone down over time over the last six months. Whereas the search impressions and the search clicks continue to stay up. Google's just sending a little bit less Um uh, of that traffic out, right? They're answering more with the answer panels or the, the snippets or, or whatever. And so mm -hmm. like trends too, like how would any one company ever know that that's happening? Right. And like the marketers are going to be sitting there trying to 
edit co- content, update content, change keywords, doing all this shit. When in reality, like Google made a decision to to tweak the algorithm a bit that kind of negatively impacted all of us or most of us. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing that, yeah. that you're going to be able to kind of give that peace of mind. Like, Oh, it's not us. It's everyone's feeling this and it's like out of our, con- unfortunately out of our control. Yeah. To some um, degree. Right. Like you can, you could yeah. out hustle, right. <laughs> if you want yeah, yes. or, or anticipate the algorithm changes and, and make your strategy to different strategy decisions. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we've gotten to you joining Databox and the reason he's joined, you saw that all these opportunities. And I mean, this is going to be intentionally a broad question, but how does one onboard as a CEO to an existing company? Like, how did you decide the, the order of operations and like what yeah. you're going to prioritize? When well, it was a very small company with, with very little revenue. They had raised um, before. Um, so the founders are the founders and the early team members are like amazing. They're all from Slovenia. They flew over here with nothing. Like they didn't even have a a apartment. They rented an apartment, set up their work. They went to Ikea, got their mattresses and their desks and, and started working. And that's how they started the company out in San Francisco. They ended up getting into Techstars Boston, ended up relocating to Boston for a little while. Um, And then like they, they had some traction. I'm skipping a lot of the story, but they had some traction and, and, uh, and they ended up closing five enterprise deals, like in their second, second, third year, um, for like, and they booked like a half a million dollars in revenue, and from it. And then, so they started raise, started going to raise, and they're like, "Well, you need a CEO. Like, you don't have never done this before. You, you, you know how to build software. You've got some sales, but like, you don't know how to scale an organization." So they ended up hiring a different CEO. This was a few years before me. And raising three point eight, they burnt through three of it. And at the end of that, like. They didn't have much. They had to get rid, of, get rid of a big portion of the team. So when I joined, there was 12 people. Um, they had already pivoted more towards like a self-serve SMB model um, and had a few thousand dollars worth of MRR. Um, so there wasn't a lot established there. Like we had to get the marketing going, build a sales process, figure out how to onboard customers. Um, and so that's mostly what I focus on is those three things, get marketing and sales yeah. and customer support going. Uh, Cause there was 12 people, 11 were engineers and product people, one person handling like inbound questions. Um, so, yeah. So you were the go to market team pretty much. Yeah. For a few months I was the, the go to market team. And then one other guy told me who's still with us and he's like, um, runs, uh, like system operations for us now. But, um, uh, and then, yeah, then I hired three, two people and then hired a salesperson. And so I gradually got myself out of each of the roles, um, so that I could at least had one person responsible for them. Um, and yeah. that, and that, that was the first year basically. Yeah. So maybe we can start with the marketing side. Uh, you mentioned earlier that towards the end of your, your time at HubSpot, you were writing a lot of content for the sales book. Yeah. I remember reading those. I, when I was just starting to like learn sales, I remember reading about GCPT in addition That's to right. that. And I was like, <laughs> I don't know if GCPT caught on as like another sales methodology, but talk not, me a lot. Not, a, uh, not like that. No. <laughs> yeah, had so a few decades head start, but yeah. 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 So I know you're very familiar with SEO and content, at least more so than other CEOs I've spoken to. Yeah. How did that influence how you thought about the go to market and marketing strategy for Databox? So when I joined, there wasn't a lot of like budget to work with. I did raise some money from like HubSpot, former HubSpot execs and other MarTech execs and stuff. So we had a bit, but not a lot to play with. And I had to like prove everything out before we could really invest in much. So that's why I was very hands on on those things and and that impacted our marketing strategy too uh basically couldn't spend a lot of money on ads i think it would have been premature to spend money on ads anyways uh and so basically and having spent nine years at hubspot and also i did seo before i joined hubspots like i knew the power of it um so uh so basically we're like all right we're gonna do content marketing uh and the hard part about doing content, hard and good part about content marketing at Databox is that our product's use case is pretty simple. You pull all your data in from other systems. Um, and there isn't a whole lot to write about, <laughs> really. It's the, what you do, even what you do afterwards with Databox, right? Um, and, you know, we have more fancy stuff coming out that we'll write about and use to market the product more aggressively. But, but, um, we built a relatively simple funnel. We would write about all of our integrations. 
So we now have like 100 plus integrations with tools like all the Google products, HubSpot products, Facebook, social nets, ad platforms, et cetera. And so we just wrote like, how do you improve metric X using HubSpot? How do you improve metric Y using Facebook ads? You know, how should, what's best practices for running Facebook ads? Like we would write that, but what I realized is like, I couldn't hire one person to write all that stuff. There's no one that has expertise on all that. So, so what we did is we started crowdsourcing quotes. We, we would basically put up a forum and ask like 10, 20, 30 people the same few questions. And that, and then we'd take that and we'd weave that into an article. Because if you ask the, you know, ask an open-ended question of 10 people, you're going to get at least five or six different answers. Um, and so that's what enabled us to like build out our content strategy and get us to the point where I think we're just shy of like 6,000 signups a month from our free product for our free product. Um, wow. The other piece of our, of our strategy was our conversion strategy where we would just take and create um, dashboard templates using our product and, and then put them up on our website, explain what they are and point people to try them out for free in our free product. So like we'd write about Facebook ads, how to improve your ROAS or whatever, or your CPC or whatever, uh, reduce your CPC. And then on that piece of content, we would say, Hey, check what your ROAS is or analyze your ROAS or download this face, this popular Facebook ads template to check all of your Facebook ads metrics in one spot. So, uh, or download this and check Facebook and Google Ads metrics in one spot. Like so, we would basically have these templates that people could take and in like a minute get set up and see their data inside our product. And so that's our that's I'm been so our marketing impressed. strategy basically for six years. I'm so impressed that you started with that because what you typically hear is it take it's a longer term play. And yeah, maybe maybe the company wasn't really like itching or needed revenue immediately, but it's it's a it's not something where you see immediate returns on, but it yeah. seemed to play out. Like, how did we did because there's an added benefit of like engaging the audience, right? The people that quoted, we quoted in our article were people that were also prospective ICP. customers. Yeah, in our ICP yeah. market, client profile. Yeah, so, yeah, so a lot of those people were marketing agencies. We would reach out because they want to they wanna brag about their expertise. They want to share their insights. They want to link to their website. They want to be able to say, hey, I was quoted in this article over here. Um, and so we would reach out to them and then 40% of our customer base is marketing agencies. Um, Got so, it. so you had a partner go to market as well then, because they want to, cont to contribute to data box blog. They show their expertise. They link to it and share it. Their prospects also see them sharing their expertise and they keep wanting to work with you on content exactly. and getting links, yeah. of course. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And trying out our product, yeah, just like you talked about. Yeah. It's like I'm thinking about check, or, you know, I'm gonna check out DataBox now and maybe move from Looker Studio. That's that's our selling, like, and we have because we have free product, free trial. We have like 18 hour chat support. People will jump on calls. They don't sell. They help set up. Like we have this process. So it's like very low touch. It's like you have to make every step, uh, uh yeah. you know, decide, and it's very low pressure, I should say. Um, so yeah, so that's our initial outreach and that's how we get people in the funnel and, and, and yeah. then, and then we of have course continue to work with them Yeah, on content. Have you started investing in paid marketing at all yet? None. No. Why not? The only thing we did, so we launched an affiliate program uh, and that, that works fairly well. We have, you know, hundreds of affiliates and it drives hundreds of signups a month for us um, with minimal effort. Um, but the... What we found is that some of those affiliates were paying um, uh, for our branded terms in ads <laughs> <laughs> and doing an arbitrage where you know they'd spend maybe a thousand dollars a month and get a hundred signups, and then they'd get four sales out of that, or we get four sales out of that, and we pay them twenty percent commission, and they're like, "Ooh, this is great." Um, so we put an end to that through our terms of service, but. Um, but so for a while we were doing that. It was like, well, if it works for them, let's see what happens for us. Um, but we found that it really just kind of, it didn't really increase the overall pie um, for us. Uh, so we just stopped spending money on it. And um, maybe our competitors are getting some extra clicks that we aren't because they're bidding on our branded terms, but it is what it is. Um, and so, yeah, we've never done any like paid funnel or, you know, targeting high, lower intent keywords or anything. Or, yeah. Yeah. Why, why is that? Like, do you not feel like the, the ROAS or return on investment makes sense to scale that up? Or is it sort of like 
Our ASP is really low. Our, our average sale price is, is right around 200, a little over 200 bucks a month. Um, it's pretty self-serve business. We're selling the SMB, so churn is a bit higher than I'd like. Um, I see. And so doing the math, it's hard to do the math. It's kind of one or the other. It's like, yeah, I could like stop doing content marketing and do paid and make it work too. But like doing both on top, it's a hard thing to justify. Um, and every time it comes up, I'm like, well, I'd rather invest in the product or I'd rather invest in product marketing or I'd rather invest in building a bigger account management team. So it just feels like the right decision for our customers is never spend more money on ads. Um, it's always... Yeah do something else. So that's kind of where we're at. So we maintain the, the, um, yeah, the SEO and the content marketing. We've, we have made an investment in like more, um, demand creation type content. Um, yeah. And so I'd rather do that and like get our unique positioning out to the market. Um, you know, work highlight our partners more in our content through the demand creation process that we have and then like send money to google and facebook and linkedin and all that <laughs> what what does demand creation look like to you like what, what sort of activities fall into that bucket that you all are doing yeah so so just maybe we should level set on the definition because people have different ones first but i'm happy to share yeah. the tactics we use as well but um I look at it as like we have we have a lot of high intent traffic. There's a lot of people visiting our website that are like Facebook ads dashboard or ads platform dashboard, gate Google, Facebook, right? Or or you know, data box <laughs> or dashboard software, right? There's there's a lot of high intent traffic that we get from SEO. Um, those people are in the market for our product. There are also a lot of people that don't use a product like ours. They don't even use Looker, for example, Looker Data Studio, um, which um, you know, Google is really Obviously, there's hundreds of thousands of companies, if not millions, using that. Um, but uh, so I look at it as like going out to the part of the market that isn't thinking about the idea that their business should be more data driven or that they should have a consolidated view of their performance across functions or that um, they should set goals and put them up on a dashboard screen on, in, on TV in their office. Right. Like they're not thinking about that stuff. Um, yeah, and uh, I could spend ads to try to get them to, you know, to think about that stuff, or I can go and create content that maybe speaks a little more to their current interests and needs, and introduce them to those concepts in that process. And so, like, so one of our tactics is our podcast. We've been doing it for a while. Um, John Bonini started; he was director of marketing, um, and uh, we hired Jeremiah Rizzo about a year ago. Um, to run it. He's doing a great job with it. But he, he'll bring like marketing agency owners, CEOs, uh, VPs of marketing, VP of sales on those calls, and they'll have conversations around how do you use data in your business? What's something, what's some metric you improved in your business? Um, you know, how do you help in agencies? How do you help your clients improve metrics in their business? So all that conversation around improving performance, and in there we're talking, like they're saying things that our product does. Like they're talking about how they set goals and track them. They're talking about how they have a meeting every every month to review last month's performance and by function, right? Like they're talking about those business processes that they have that our product enables. Um, but we're but we're getting the listeners to listen to it because they're more just interested in like, how does company X do this? Or Oh, that I would like to improve that metric. How do I improve that metric? Right. So we're bringing them in on stuff that's a little more interesting to them um, and then introducing them the idea of using something like Databox very, 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 very softly. Right. It's not a sell. Yeah. So it's through the guests themselves who are bringing in maybe people who want to learn from them and yeah. their companies. And yeah. like, oh, yeah, I should try to do that. OK. Yeah. But we have like we have what John Benini, our director of marketing, calls co a content flow process. We start with a research brief. I think most companies start with a content brief. We start with a research brief. It's the questions we want to ask. It's like it's the area or hypothesis that we have. It's the angle that we think uh, is re is the right one and the relevant one. And then and then we come up with like, all right, well, who do we need to talk to, or interview, or survey in order to get real stories about that hypothesis test that hypothesis yeah. 
then we will, so that might inform who we invite on as a guest on our podcast. It's also going to inform a survey that we design and run. Um, and then uh, once we interview that pe- those people on the podcast, we run that survey, and a lot of times we'll do both on the same topic. Then we'll put that in a newsletter that goes out to, um, you know, to our newsletter list, top of the funnel newsletter list. It's written by Jeremiah. It's like personality driven. It's, it's written in first person. Um, we also incorporate our benchmark data in there. So we have this, we have seventeen thousand companies that have opted into our benchmark. So we can go in and see like what is the ROAS, the return on ad spend for Facebook ads in the in the SaaS business or in SaaS industry or in real estate or whatever. Um, or all of those industries. And then we can we put that in in the survey data. Like that goes gets published with the survey. It gets talked about on the podcast. It gets mentioned in the newsletter. Um, and so and, and then we're also incorporating a lot of social posts. Um, we get a lot of traction, a lot of conversions directly from social by talking about these topics, by sharing the data that we have, um, et cetera. So so like we have this whole process that starts with a research brief, an idea, hypothesis, and then goes through like four or five different things. And we ultimately will produce an article on that. But the article is the last step of it, or often the last step. I stick the output. That's probably not even the most important thing. Um, Yeah, so it used to to be that it was like, we write the article for SEO. So we don't need to, we don't need to interview people on podcasts. We don't need to write about our newsletter. It's like write it, and that was our factory. That's how we grew to where we are now. But I think the the way people consume content and the and the competition for SEO, it just makes that process so much less effective. And that's why we've adopted this new process of really starting with the hypothesis and doing the research. It's interesting because we've landed on a very similar conclusion, and we've been helping clients move away from hey. Organic traffic is important. It's not the only metric. By the way, there's a lot of competition. Where yeah. you can win is by answering the questions that your ICP or personas have that right. probably don't have search volume, but there's right. hundred, like maybe a couple hundred very like targeted people asking these types of questions that That's right. you should write about. Because if you write yeah. about this, get it in front of them, they're going to think it's interesting versus some dry SEO like content yeah. that is written. Well, I, think there's, I think there's you two need reasons. To use your point of view. Yeah, there's two reasons to do it. You just hit on the one. So the first one is like top of the funnel, have a point of view. You got to stand out. Like you're, you're, it's not just your product that needs to stand out, but your, your positioning and your point of view needs to stand out if you want to get attention, right? And so the only way to really do that is to answer the questions that people that are on top of people's mind where there's no answer yet. It's like, no. uh, I was talking, exchanging messages with Rand Fishkin the other day from formerly SEO Moz and Spark Tour, And he was like, he, he does this really well where they like they go through data and they find insights and then they share the insights and everybody and his mother references those insights. Uh, the reason we were talking is because I just did that with Google search console data trends and like he, he shared it and we ended up talking. It's like, oh, let's do some more research on this. And so that kind of stuff gets people talking and gets your brand noticed. I got I got like 75 reposts on on that post that I posted on LinkedIn. Um, the other reason to do. Uh, answer questions is because they're so helpful in the sales process. And Mm -hmm. neither of those are going to rank because nobody's searching like Google search console algorithm trends data, right? Like maybe somebody's doing that, but it's very small. (laughs) It's not your buyer. It's some other analytical geek, right? Um, But people will talk about that data. And then no one's searching for like, uh, how does data box charge for, or how does competitor X charge for Y, right? Uh, unless they're in a buying mode. Um, but you could certainly use that article to answer a question and move your sales process along. Um, and so I think those are the two reasons to think in terms of like, what are the questions our ICP, our ideal client profile are asking themselves or asking us. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And so yeah. maybe going back to the data and getting more companies to like be data driven from, from my experience, I've, Notice that, well, lots of people are not using data despite all the data that's available to them. Maybe it's just not made easily digestible, but yeah. there's so much data out there, uh, so many ways to improve a business and so many different things that like a marketing leader or a business leader can be thinking about. It's hard to make sense of all of that. So how do you typically figure out where to prioritize your time and energy and how do you recommend others 
do that. I, I'm going to yeah. guess Databox helps with that. <laughs> yeah. So we obviously, we're our best customer, uh, our toughest customer. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, so I think the first, the first challenge that most companies have in this is that their data is all over the place. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we we use like 50 plus tools in our business that have some kind of data that gives us some kind of insight about how things are going. Um, and I don't think we're that different than most companies. Uh, and so, and even if you use, you know, some, some broad tools like a Salesforce or a HubSpot or an intercom, right? You're still got to like hunt around like crazy to find the right data or build lots of dashboards and you're moving around from screen to screen. It's, it's not the most efficient mechanism for monitoring your performance, let alone reporting it. And so I think that's the first step is like get your data all into one spot. Um, and, and the next thing, the next thing is to like build a culture around reviewing that data. Um, so that you're, so that everyone is reviewing their own performance, their managers are reviewing their performance, different managers that need to work together, are reviewing each other's performance. And then as, as executive team reviewing performance as well. Um, so I think those two things are important and that's kind of like, it's like your setup tasks, like before you go out and play, play soccer, you need sheet cleats and chin pads, right? Like that's your, that's your first step. I don't know what sports you play, but that, that's my favorite sport. Um, and so that's step one. I think where most companies then struggle is making sense of all that data, like which metrics are important, which metrics impact one another. Is that performance good? I think that's a really hard question to answer. And then the question I think you posed, which is like, what should we do to improve that performance? Um, and historically you needed like an analyst, you needed smart executives, you needed to hire consultants or service providers. Um, and all that stuff's important. Like you're still gonna need those people. But I think over time, what we'll see is that algorithms start to answer more of those questions. They'll answer the questions like, is our performance good compared to companies like ours? Um, are we doing the right things to improve our performance? So the most efficient or effective things to improve our performance. Where are we likely to perform at the end of the month, the end of the quarter, the end of the year, based on what our data is, how our data is trending now, or um, what our leading indicators are? Um, what's happening right now that we need to address, right? We all have, unfortunately, fire drills in our business where like something shit hits a fan. And so oftentimes we don't know about it until the next week when somebody's like, oh, by the way, or, or you look at your report at the end of the month and it's like, oh shit, we should have caught that one earlier. Um, and so I think algorithms are, are so much better at paying attention to the thousands of metrics that your business is, you know, producing or thousands of data points that you're are like the byproduct of your, of your work or your customer interactions or whatever. Um, and those algorithms will be able to say, Hey, this seems out of line. This is, this is an anomaly from where you normally are. Um, and like I could keep going. There's all these, there's, there's correlations. I think that are so much easier for machines to make than humans, right? Like, you know, as an expert marketer that like the revenue that a company produces is going to be impacted by their uh, the traffic, the signups or the leads they get is going to be impacted by the traffic that they get, which is impacted by the the rankings they have, which is impacted by the competition of that, like which is impacted by what Google decided to do with their algorithm last quarter or a change they made, right? So, like you know all that, but like most, maybe you don't. Maybe, I think you do, right? <laughs> but you, most humans don't. Like most CEOs that are running a SaaS business outside of Martech don't understand all those relationships. Uh, and those are just, just like one set of relationships. There's you can do the same thing in different functions. Like you can look at it by salesperson. Like there's all these different uh, um, ways of, of looking at cause and effect, which humans in our experience kind of suck at. We've, we've taught many how to do it. We tried to teach people how to do it. But in reality, it's like they just, they just keep doing the shit that they did before. Yeah, what I've learned is everything you just said are all the thoughts and questions that go on in my head at any given time. And I've learned that it's very challenging to, to teach someone how to think about all the different connections and make those connections and think about correlations and decide what's not causation, and what's just correlation and things right. like that. Yeah. So I'd love to hear maybe a, to make it tangible for some of the folks listening to this who are sort of like, what's, what's Pete talking about? <laughs> Does a situation maybe come to mind for you where there are all these different things happening at Databox and you kind of have to triage and figure out 
all right, we're going to focus here. Like, do you have an example in mind of how you did that? Sure. Yeah. So one of the, one of the things was our decision to invest more in demand creation. Like for years, we ran this play, SEO playbook and when we started it, like there was one other company doing something similar uh, and they were kind of behind us um, in this regard. Right. And, um, and they've caught up and they leapfrogged us on a, on a project. Right. Meanwhile, there's like five other, five other um, companies that have entered the space copying our, our playbook on SEO and targeting the same keywords. Meanwhile, some of the, our, in, our best integration partners, I won't name names, but they improved their analytics tools and started pulling away, like pulling away search traffic as well. And so two, two decisions I made out of that based off of that data was one, we need to differentiate our product better, um, which we we're doing, we've started doing and making progress on. And two is we need to diversify our, our channels. Like we can't, if, you know, if going from the fifth spot to the first spot on, on, Google with the same strategy as the other four, it's like a war of attrition, right? Like it's like, <laughs> it's not gonna help. It's not, it's not easy and it's, and it's not gonna work very well. So um, so that was one, um, trying to think of, of other ones. We also noticed, and this is true in most SaaS businesses, but that companies that um, set up certain features, new features that we launched, um, in our products, we're much more likely to re, uh, use the use more of the product and retain longer. And so we, we had an analyst to like look at that and like do the correlation. Like in the future, software should do that, right? And that's what we're building. But what we did in response to that was like, oh, okay, well that feature is something that people are really using. And it was like it was a feature we built because like we we it was like a. It was like a band aid for something a customer asked for. It was like, oh, okay, well, we can do this quick. Let's do this. And it was like, oh, shit, that totally changed the way a proportion of our customers use our product. And it was, it, the simple thing was like, we have dashboards that fit automatically on any screen. So they're constrained like a computer screen. You can't, they don't scroll indefinitely. And so people were like, I need to put more data on my dashboard. And so they were squeezing shit in and just making the dashboard unreadable. So what we did is like, oh, well, we can string two dashboards together. One, two, and make it so that they just click to the second one, right? And they can go back and toggle back and yeah. forth really easy. Simple solution. Like it was not a big project and it solved a big pain point for customers. But then we're like, now they started using it to present in meetings. And so like, oh, that's a new case for our product. Maybe we should build a tool that allows them to produce a report and add context. Like, so like, though, like following the usage patterns of our product allows us to think like, what should we build next, right? Uh, based on those things. Um, and so every business has those, especially SaaS businesses, where like you're going to have a million things going on in your product and your marketing and your sales and your customer support, where you're going to see trends and or anomalies and say, hey, what is that? Um, and should we react to that? But I don't think humans are good at like monitoring all that at all times. Yeah, it's a lot. Right? Or even even in a semi regular basis. And so yeah, like we just brought out a feature now where. You plug in all your data, you pick your metrics, and you pick hundreds or thousands of metrics. And then we just tell you the ones that went up the most and the ones that went down the most in the last week. It's like the first time I look at it, I'm like, oh, shit, I should dig into that. <laughs> well, my hope is folks listening to this go sign up for data, like the free version of Thanks. Datavox and connect a data source and like, have to free for find free. something that they would have never caught. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Amazing. No, uh, no money. You, you can do it for free. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned... Um, competing like the space is getting a lot more competitive i mean mm -hmm. software in general is getting yeah really commoditized great. yeah how do you how do you think about differentiation and then not just differentiation of the product but communicating that to prospects because i imagine mm -hmm. they're like what's the difference Hard. between data box and this other product like, they're, they're the same and your product yeah. marketers might be like they're not the same <laughs> how do you how do you get them to see that yeah no it's funny um so yeah my we're not the same. Um, there are things that are different about us. If you go to G2, you can see that we're easier to set up, easier to use. People like our visuals much better when they're presenting it, especially the clients. They're more attractive, people say. Um, so there are differences. We have more integrations out of the box, so you don't need third-party connectors for something like Lucre, right? There's all these little things, but they all kind of like they're, – they're things that don't matter until you start using the product, right? You're not going to decide – 
to switch from Looker to Databox if you are getting what you need out of Databox because the, the visualizations are prettier, right? It's but when you're evaluating stuff, it might add up. But that's not the way I think of differentiation. I don't think of it at the feature level. I first think of it as like who are you serving, um, and then what's the value pro- the high level value prop? Like what's the business, the transformational business change that you can deliver to them? And so for us, we do cover a broad market, but a good portion of our business are marketing agencies. And so we rolled out this tool about six months ago where marketing agencies can actually create their own performance benchmark study or live performance benchmark um, where they can invite specific types of companies into their benchmark and with confidence say that company, company of type X typically performs in this way across 70 plus different tools. And so like we have an, we have a, a partner that only works with cosmetic surgeons. So then they go to the next cosmetic surgeon or their existing cosmetic surgery clients and they say, hey, here's how your, your performance compares against 120 other companies. Like that, that cosmetic surgeon's like, oh shit, okay, I should pay attention to this, right? Um, and so we built that because agencies are our customer. And I think that's the first way you gotta differentiate is like, who's your customer and what's some, un- and then the next question is like, what's some unique value I can provide? Um, the next big unique thing we're doing is is all of these AI power features in our paid product, that benchmarking thing we offer for free. Um, and so in our paid product, it's a lot of stuff we talked about. It's like, I think it's overwhelming for people to like, even if they get all their data into a system like Databox, it's overwhelming for them to pay attention to it. It's overwhelming for them to try to predict what's going to happen. It's overwhelming for them to spot any p- possible problem, right? It's overwhelming for them to set goals um, that are realistic and you know that their team can achieve. And so all of these things can be done better through AI and algorithms. And I'm not, we're probably not the only one building this stuff, but there's nothing out there right now that's doing this. And we're actually uniquely positioned to solve this because of the way our system is architected. And it, it, it's never been a differentiation for us, but we always knew that it would be. Um, but when we build integrations, we define metrics and we store those metric values. And so when we say, when we look at, the, you know, for example, sessions from your website, we know that that's sessions and we know that we can compare that to 100 other marketing agencies, for example, and their sessions. Yeah. And we've done that for literally thousands and thousands of metrics. So that gives us ability to start to apply some of these machine learning models uh, and spit out recommendations, spit out recommendations on where you should be where you should be performing or how you should improve performance or what your forecast should be or what your forecast is. Like we know our system understands the context behind these metrics and how they correlate to each other and all that other stuff. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. I have kind of a love hate relationship with benchmarks. When, when I was head of growth at at people AI, my chief product officer was who I reported to was always like, what does good look like? Like what are some benchmarks we can hold ourselves against? And, we were just getting their freemium motion set up, but he was comparing us to very established freemium businesses already. I'm like, I have the same. There's no way we can com- we can compare ourselves <laughs> to that. It's a different business model, different yeah. persona, different market, uh, okay. different product, yes. and I feel like it it always put me kind of on my heels. But I also understand the value of well, can we at least have a, like a target or <laughs> like something in mind? So yeah. I mean, how yeah, do you end up deciding? Exactly. Okay, this is the thing. Yeah, it's funny because I'm laughing because the, the founder is very similar to your uh, founder of Databox, main founder is two fa- co-founders, but the guy that like re- is, is like my partner, basically, we run the business together. Uh, he he says the same thing. He He's constantly reading about other companies and mostly companies he admires that are like, you know, we're doing 7 million ARR. These companies are doing 100 million ARR, like a billion ARR, right? Like, uh, and so he's looking, he's like, well, what's the benchmark? What, what, should, what are those companies doing? And like, Devin, like, we're not even on the same playing field. Like we are, we are on like, <laughs> we're on little league and they're in the majors. Like they literally have a team of 50 marketers and, you know, yeah. PhDs run in their CS organization, right? Like that with 30 years of experience, and all their managers are, you know, like top notch and, and like, we're, and, and trained, right? Like we're a bootstrapped company that have largely, tr- you know, hired junior people and built systems and trained them and, and, you know, think very thoughtfully about every hundred dollars we spend. So like we're a different business. <laughs> um, so to answer your question, like I, I agree with you, right? A hundred percent. Like it's not fair always to say, here's our benchmark, but what we've built 
in benchmark and benchmark groups is like you can actually segment the benchmark data by criteria. So you can say, show me series A or show me SaaS companies or marketing agencies with less than 10 employees or less than 5 million AR or whatever, whatever the, the is. And so we have some out of the box um, segmenting capabilities, um, but we also have integrated surveys in there. So you can actually start to run surveys and segment based off of answers to those questions. So for example, um, we're running a survey right now um, where we're asking companies, um, uh, let's see, I'm kind of come up with it. I'm asking agencies, uh, how are you marketing your business? It's in a multiple choice yeah, uh, set of questions. And so then we'll be able to go yeah. and say like the, comp- the agencies that do this um, get more traffic, get more conversions, right? We'll start to be able to correlate the business performance to the business practice practices. Um, so, yeah, I think you know, I saw one of, one of the data points was a lot of most marketing agencies don't have any marketing budget. And I thought that's that right. Was, yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. That, that's like, ironic. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I probably, I probably like piss off my target market as much as I entertain them, <laughs> but as much as I sell them, but like, yeah, I posted like, why, you know, I think I posted something like, uh, you know, client asks agency, uh, or client tells agency, like, we, you know, we need a minimum of $5,000 a month to, to provide services to you. And then the client says like, well, how much do you spend on your marketing? What? We don't spend money on our marketing. <laughs> <laughs> not quite that but is you need to yeah, you need to like we don't need to but you need to um, so yeah so I think uh, yeah that was one data point but we we're just building the system we're just launching the like we've been doing surveys forever we're just integrating the survey data into the benchmark data and um, and so it's a community play again that's a free product so people can go benchmark themselves for free they can take surveys for free they can see the response the aggregate responses of the surveys for free um, and so we've launched this product to try to help people see how should they be performing versus true head-to-head comparisons, and also what should what are other companies doing in order to be top performers? What do the top performer companies mm-hmm. do in, that that are similar to me? Um, and so you could still have a reasonable comparison, but also have that aspiration of like I want to be more like a top performing company. What do I need to do? And I, that's a lot more empowering than saying like. Hey, let's go compare your Series A SaaS startup, brand new product led growth motion to, you know, Atlassian, who's a billion, multi billion dollar business and basically came up with the concept, right? 10 years ago. Yes. Yeah. Funny because that was an actual conversation. Yeah, I've, I've, I've had it. I've had it. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned something in passing just now that you're bootstrapped, um, but you also mentioned that there was some venture uh, yes. uh, capital that came in or some angel investing. I also know that from a previous podcast you did that you're you're cash flow positive, you're profitable. Um, so Close to it. We, does, we decided to burn a little bit, but yes. Got it. So what does it look like to like build this software company like you're bootstrapped, but also have like this cash available? Like that's that's discipline compared to what we've seen in the last <laughs> I don't know ten years. Yeah, um, we have really big ambitions um, because it was a little bit of a reboot. Like we, we needed to prove ourselves out. And that was kind of the initial thing is like, we, we, we wouldn't have been able to, like, I raised some money when I joined, not a lot, like a million bucks. Um, I know it's a lot to a lot of people, but like for <laughs> building, building a SaaS startup, it's not a lot. Um, and there was like 800 left. So we had like 1.8 in the bank. Um, so we needed, needed to basically take that 1.8 million and prove that we could build some traction somehow. And so that's how we kind of got started with like a boot set, boot, bootstrappers mindset, I should say. We clearly weren't bootstrapping, right? Very few companies get to raise close to five million and call it bootstrapping. Um, but we operated like we we burned money that first year because you know we had no no revenue, so there wasn't really much or very little revenue to offset any expenses. But you know, at the end of that first year, we still had like maybe fifteen people, um, so it wasn't like a big burn rate. Uh, still had money left from from, the, from those raises, and then um, and we kind of I think in year I want to say like year two we got to the point where we're like ah eh, we could be cash flow positive, and so <laughs> we don't need to raise right, and so like oh let's keep doing what we're doing like we'll keep making smart investments and uh, gradually other business. Um, we it's also like a really ambitious product. It's a hard product to build and support because we have so many integrations. Um, and uh, and so like there was some like the, and, but that's the value problem. The value problem is like pull all your data into one spot. So it's kind of hard to like d- 
do that half ass. Um, but doing that requires a lot of time and effort. And so we kind of just needed time to pull a lot of that off. Um, and so we kind of just say, all right, well, let's just keep bootstrapping it sort of, you know, staying cash flow. Cash flow. And so um, along the way, we realized like, all right, well, this space is growing. AI is getting huge. Um, companies aren't going to have less data in the future that they need to monitor and report on. It's going to just keep going. And it's competitive. So we said, all right, well, what do we need to do to like get to the next level? Um, and we said, all right, we can continue to do some of that. We can do most of that without capital. We just have to be really thoughtful about priorities. Um, and the way we look at it is like, if we can get pieces of this puzzle right, um, that we'll, like, we'll name, we'll, we'll be able to raise capital in our terms. Uh, and that's kind of what our, like, what our mission is, is like, let's do it frugally to the point where we can give away very little, very, not much more equity, but raise a decent, raise a good amount of money. And that's kind of like, it feels like it's the right, it feels like we're capable of doing it. And so that's the approach we've taken. Yeah. We did, and we're at, we're at an ARR level, 7 million ARR, where we can take loans. And so we've done that. We've done a loan with uh, lighter capital, two of them, where we can take some loan, have money on the, ba on the balance sheet, make some investments without worrying about, you know, cash flow um, and, you know, and pay back over a multi-year period. Um, so, yeah. So we just haven't needed it's, it. It sounds like, it sounds like the way most companies should have been running their or mostly yeah, right now, yeah, yeah, after we've been through <laughs> COVID, bank failures, inflation, yeah, <laughs> crazy election yeah. cycles, like, yeah, worse, like you would think, you, you look, we look geniuses for like geniuses running yeah. this way, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't any grand plan. It was kind of more just happened to that happen that way. Yeah. I wanted to dig into something you mentioned in our previous episode, uh, where podcast you did about essentially the operational cadence or a management cadence of Databox, at least from the way you described it, it seemed like you had a great system in place. You talked about tight project management and processes and accountability to data and like reporting. Was the culture always like that? Or like, how did you tactically, tactically build that sort of culture? Um, Cause that's, that's something where you mentioned earlier, like you got to build yeah. the data into the culture. Like how did you go, go about that? Yeah, so we're always looking at data, right? Like our product is built in it. Like I said earlier, we're our best customer. We, we monitor like everything inside our product. Um, and so that wasn't the hard part for us. Um, I think the harder part is like um, identifying what to do to improve performance, agreeing on that and communicating that out. That's the hard part. And I think early in a startup, that's not hard because – it's a small group of decision makers. You can get in a room, make a decision and go. And like, you're all working with each other to make it happen the next day, next week, next month. And so like, you kind of all just observe the progress or lack thereof. Right. Um, and so like, you don't need much, but once we got to like 70 people, hundred people, that became a lot harder and it's still hard. Yeah. Um, and, but what we do is, is we follow a, a, an annual, like, focus kind of mission priority realignment. So like, we'll look and say, what are the three, five things we need to get done this year? We want to get done this year that we think will have the biggest impact. Uh, me and the founder spent a lot of time doing that. Um, we of course circulated with the rest of the team, get feedback and kind of validate things externally, all that. Um, once we get that done, then we go into like execution mode on a quarterly basis where we delegate ownership to leaders with a group and that those groups are often cross-functional um not always but often cross-functional and they uh they're responsible for coming up with the quarterly plan uh based on the annual target so they might come to us and say like we won't make progress on the metrics this quarter but we'll lay the foundation to do that in q2 or q3 for example or our 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 performance for this quarter will be determined on whether we hit this binary objective of launching this or establishing this process or whatever that is. Um, and so every quarter that team decides, all right, here's our basket of projects that we're going to prioritize. 
we go through an ICE process where you look at impact, confidence, effort, uh, and we evaluate it. They present that to me, the founder and other executives that are, you know, have resources needed or, or have expertise that's relevant. Uh, and then we kind of say, yes, go forward with these. And like, no, this one needs more massaging or like, no, this is a stupid idea. Or we might even say like, hey, why didn't you guys look at this? Please go look at this. Um, and then uh, and then they execute for a quarter. We try to leave that go for like two and a half months um, and then evaluate it towards the end of that and then have that process repeat itself. Um, it's a combination of like the OKR process popularized by like Google, created by Intel and Andy Grove, um, EOS a little bit, entrepreneurial operating system. Um, and then then some stuff we do on a more regular basis that I don't think anyone's pioneered because the technology didn't exist to do this, but like on a monthly and a weekly basis and even a daily basis, there is cadence of things that we do using our own product to like, so to stay on top of what's happening. Um, so for example, the sales team has an OKR around uh, getting more uh, payments up front getting more customers to buy annually mm -hmm. instead of monthly or quarterly. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're the sales manager and my v VP of sales and service is he's, they're monitoring that on a daily weekly basis. Right. I don't look at that until like the end and I might see it if they tell me about it, but I'm not going to look at that until the end of the quarter. Um, right. But uh, maybe the end of the month, because it's in our monthly deck that we review, but um so like there's these processes that these teams have, whether it's a functional team or an OKR team to like review progress on a, on a more frequent basis to make yeah. sure things are on, on track. So. Do you have like a chief of staff or I imagine maybe a, a sort of, yeah. keeping track of all of that? Yeah. So, um, I'm not the most organized guy in the world. Um, I'm not, <laughs> I'm a creative. I like to try new things. I like to figure shit out, like give me something to figure out and I will be a dog on the bone to figure it out. Um, but when it comes to like doing something for the third or fourth or fifth time, I'm like, shoot me now. Um, so, uh, so yes, uh, a, a woman named Tori, uh, Shear is on my team. Um, it actually she changed her name and I, she just got married. I forget her last name. Oh, that's bad. <laughs> Maybe you can edit that out. Um, <laughs> she'll be fine with it. Um, so anyways, Tori has been with us. She was my first hire uh, six years ago. She started in customer success. She onboarded our, you know, the first few hundred customers that I sold. Um, and and uh, and so she's been with us forever. She understands all our go-to market processes. Um, she's like my right hand and my left hand, my joke. Um, <laughs> so she's making sure that these systems occur. Uh, these systems, the, the OKR process goes, that the quarterly write-ups get done. Like, but each executive and OKR leader is responsible for their own like processing of this, of you know, running the process, having the meetings, um, writing up their plan, checking in on progress. Like, so so it's pretty well delegated um, to different parts of the company, um, and and that way I can be freed up to focus in on strategy, focus in on. Uh, validation of stuff, figuring st new stuff out, new processes out. Um, and you know, I'm very active on, on social. So getting the message out, li literally working with our partners on stuff. So like, I'm more, I'm much more like kind of marketing salesy with, in terms of inno uh, innovating so I can do what I'm good at. And she, she handles most of the rest. So um, the founder is also the founder also runs product engineering, HR and finance. And he, um, he's very methodical, um, himself. Okay. So, so I tend to only, and I, it took me maybe a few years of my career to figure this out, but I realized that, uh, I suck at the rep repetitive stuff. Um, but I'm without sounding arrogant. I'm good at the figuring out stuff, really good at it, especially when it's like in my wheelhouse and, and based on my experience. So, um, so like, that's where, that's where I focus. And it wasn't until later in my that. career when I was allowed to be that guy, because, you know, when you're the sales, you're the salesperson, you have to do the sales call over and over again. So, um, but now that I'm later in my career, I kind of get to do the stuff that I'm good at and that I like doing and that I want to do and have other people help me out with the really, really important other stuff that I'm not good at or interested in doing. Yeah. Uh, you're the, you're the naturally the visionary and then you have operators yeah. and integrators yeah, around yeah. you to, 
right. make sure everything happens. Yeah, you, it sounds like you know the so, EOS model. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The operator. yeah. Do you uh, still have an itch to build something from scratch? Um, yeah. 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 Could you tell? <laughs> You mean like a new a business? Bit. I mean, you mean like a new yeah, business? Really. No, this will be. Yeah. I hope. I hope this is my last one. Um, I might like if okay. I retire, I'll, I'll write. I'll write and garden. Maybe do a little consulting or advising here. But I like. I don't want to ever do this again. I don't want to ever start a business again. <laughs> with with, like it's it's not that I don't like it or I'm not and that I'm bad at it. It's just like, um, it's not my passion, right? It's like my my yeah. my passion is innovation and scaling things. Um, but not from an operations perspective and, and, and I don't need, I, you know, I did well at HubSpot. I don't need to work financially. So I, like I, I'm at a point in my life, you can see the gray beard and the, and the ball veins, like I guess to start to think about what I want to do when I'm not working. And that's where, yeah, I'm not there yet. I'm five, 10 years away from that, but, but that's what I'm, so I, I don't, I don't, I don't love being an operator of a business. It's not my thing. I, and, yeah. um, so no, so I don't have a plan to do that again. However, we are innovating like a lot at Databox. I, I've, I off, I've said this internally, I haven't said it externally, but like I feel like we're in the process of figuring out product market fit all over again. We have product market fit for our first product. It's not like we need to need to do this, but we're innovating so much that we're like, this is a new, this is a new market. It's a new value prop, like new new pain points, um, you know, new uh, processes to sell to onboard. Like there's a lot to figure out. We're still at the very top of the <laughs> figuring out the value prop of the pain points we we have theories and we're testing them and we think we got stuff right but but um we're still early and so that i love that's like fun that's that's amazing to me i and so i'm excited to be doing that stuff um and yeah, i think it's necessary for you, me you mentioned things that you would do when you're when you're done working like writing gardening soccer like, yeah what are you what are you writing about <laughs> what, what would you oh, so actually, i have a book that i've started, book that I've started. i have a book that i've started um and uh, a business book. I have two biz two or three business books I'd like to write. Uh, this one, this first one, is 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 related to partnerships um, and how partnerships can help a company scale faster and more profitably. Um, and so, sharing what I did at HubSpot, sharing what I did at DataBox, sharing what I've done in some uh, advisory stuff I've done with other companies, um, and how I think about it, the frameworks I use, um, the 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 tactical steps I take. Um, that that so that'll be my first book, um, but I like exploring things. I feel like I feel like there's always questions to be asked and answered, and to me that's what writing is. It's it's research and writing. It's not just like sit down and write what I know or make up a story. It's it's like interviewing. It's running surveys. It's doing research and it's exploring the world. I think increasingly that's the way companies need to market um, is collaborating with their audience, collaborating with their customers and their partners. Uh, out in the open, right? Most of that stuff, I think, happens behind the scenes, and then companies come up with this polished positioning. It's like we just got to repeat this a million times, and we'll be great. Like I don't think that will work because the world's just moving too fast, and you got to continually be asking questions and innovating and and all that. And so that's that's kind of uh, that's what I would do on the writing side. Um, I, I I so I do write. You know, I write a lot, um, short form stuff, yeah. um, and then. Uh, Gardening, I have a big, huge perennial garden. Like I got, I've planted thousands of, of flowers and shrubs and You're, trees. You planted yourself. You've done yes. it all yourself. Yes, all myself. Wow. Yeah, I have these massive beds. They're like, I probably have the size of like most mansions. I have that in beds. <laughs> uh, like probably have 5,000 square feet of, of flower beds that I've built. Um, and for the most part maintain, although I do hire some people to help me maintain, maintain it once in a while. And then I'm avid. I'm I've played soccer all my life, uh, so I still play on a, a, a men's team. Um, I, my coaching career just ended. My son just went into high school, but I coached from nursery school to eighth grade and took my boys that I coached. For, most of the boys I coached for the, in that for those eight years, sixteen season. I took them to the state final game. Um, so wow. yeah, so they unfortunately we lost, but um, but uh, we were excited and I was proud of what they accomplished. So so yeah, no soccer is my. Gardening and soccer are my first love. Um, maybe right after math and data, but um, but uh, but yeah, and writing. Yeah, so yeah, that's what I would do. I love. I think the assumption that's safe to make here is it, it sounds like you set pretty good guardrails with 
when you end work and when you're going to spend time with family and these other like gardening and other things you want to do rather than, I don't know, working 15 hour days. Uh, it's just, no, I'm not, I wouldn't Maybe say that. I'm actually <laughs> mad at that. It's just like, um, it's the, the, I'm not good at being intentional with my personal life. Uh, it's a, it's an issue uh, that I sh- always struggle with. There are times when I'm better at it, but I, my work consumes me for sure. Uh, uh, because I'm so obsessed yeah. with proving out hypotheses or, you know, innovating on something. And, um, and so, you know, my work consumes me for sure. I do force myself to just stop. I don't feel like I get a mental break though, unless I'm playing soccer. And that's w- one of the reasons why mm-hmm. I love soccer is because I can't think about like work <laughs> while I'm playing soccer. It's, you know, you need to no. be thinking about what do I do next all the time. So, so like soccer is my true stop gardening. I tend to put like a podcast on and I just love it. Like, I love the output. Um, I like the physical part of it. It's like exercise. It's not intense exercise, but, but it gets my body moving and, different directions and all that. So, uh, but yeah, no, I'm not the best at it, uh, at drawing online. No, it's an area of yeah, well, uh, area of, yeah. of work needed. Yeah. You at least have the things to counteract at least the, yes. The, and, and I, and I do mental. make, I make time to spend with my family, uh, my, my wife and son we have dinner every night. I make it or she makes it like we, there's, there's routine that we, that ba- gives me balance, but, but, uh, my, my brain doesn't always shut off, which is the problem. Yeah. I can totally relate. Um, sure many. Well, I know we, we, we've gone over a bit, um, got some closing questions for you and then we can wrap it up. Sure. Let's do it. All right. So what's one opinion you have about business that you think people would disagree with? Um, I think partnerships are the key to everything. Like, uh, and I actually don't know that a lot of people like would say, Oh, you're wrong. But very few people act on the fact that I think partnerships are the key. Like most, most companies just, yeah, they'd rather cold eat, cold spam people than like figure out how to build a partnership with somebody else that could refer them business. So that's probably number one is partnerships are the key. It, I think going forward, yeah. it's just going to be harder and harder to sell and market directly, and you need to have partnerships. My hope is people continue to be slow to adopt that because that's what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is what's one impactful piece of advice you've been given? One impactful piece of, oh, wow, so many. Uh, oof. I, um, one thing I, I learned a lot from Brian Halligan, um, I know a lot of people did, um, you know, founder and CEO, former CEO of HubSpot, chairman of HubSpot now. Um, he, he used to talk a lot about this, so you probably remember too, but like, and he, it was from a book, like the Blue Ocean Strategy, but it's about building a product that, um, that, where you're not competing against a red ocean of competitors. And I think that probably the most important, one of the most important lessons I learned at HubSpot. It's been hard to apply at Databox, to be frank, but um, I think we're doing a really good job of applying it now. Um, and so maybe that, maybe that one. Um, I don't know if that's good enough. <laughs> yeah, hard, hard to do, but definitely one of the best pieces. Of the very, business. very hard to do. Too. Yes. Yeah. What's one book that you'd recommend more people read? Oh, the book I've been recommending like crazy lately is um, David C. Baker's book. Um, I always get the name a little screwed up, but but if you Google this, you'll find it. It's um, it's the secret trade craft of elite advisors. Uh, if you don't know David, you probably do, but he's been advising agencies, marketing agencies, and consultants um, for several decades, um, and. Uh, he's built a very successful business of his own and he's helped agencies immensely. I know many agencies that have gone through his consulting or hired him for advice that and implemented it that are just like, you know, treat him like a, put him up on the appropriate pedestal. Of the yeah. <laughs> uh, and so this book is a bit of a culmination of, or a combination of like work he's helped other companies do, but also work he's done in his own business. Uh, and he shared with me this and he's given me permission to share. He's, He's, I think he's did 1.7 million in revenue last year, and he was just one guy for most of that year. He just hired, uh, I believe, his son, um, or at least another guy with the same last name. Um, and, and so there's two people, and so he shares 
both the formula that he runs and the formula that he's helped his clients. And like, it's a very s simple book to read, very practical, real stories. Like, um, you'll breeze, they'll breeze through it. And anybody that's selling advice for a living or selling business transformation for a living or any of that, like it's a, it's a playbook. It's a great playbook to follow. So anyways, that's one. I love it. I'm going to get that book yeah, today. Good. Um, I know of his other book, I think it's the, the business of expertise, but I haven't heard yes. which one is. Yeah. The business of expertise was his, was not his first book. He's written many books, but was his most recent book before this. And if you're, gotcha. if you're uh, a consultant or an agency and you're, and you're, you're thinking about like your positioning in the market, business of expertise is the right book to start with. But if you're beyond that, and I think you are, uh, cause you're already kind of niched down and everything. Um, then I would start with the next one, which is much more practical book on how to like build productized services, build data assets that you can use to compel clients or even um, analyze clients in a proprietary way. Like it's all about bidding really high margin products and services. Um, it's, it. It, it's pretty brilliant. Yeah. Thanks for all the recommendations yeah. and advice. Uh, yeah. Last question here is where can people find you on the internet? Uh, I've been very active on LinkedIn, so my preference is LinkedIn. Um, I am not very good at managing multiple inboxes, um, but I do try to pay attention to LinkedIn. I'm active on LinkedIn publishing, and so that naturally results in the conversations, and uh, so I try to stay, stay, uh, be responsive on there. Awesome. Well, Pete, it was a pleasure to have you on a show. I'm glad we got to reconnect, and thanks for making Same. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Bye.